Good afternoon and welcome to our tips for a healthy pregnancy panel. This is hosted by Tallahassee Memorial Healthcare. We thank you all for joining us for this year's Baby and Family Fair. It's a virtual series and we look forward to addressing your top questions about keeping yourself and your baby healthy throughout your pregnancy. My name is Tanya Little and I'll be the moderator today. I work here at Premier Health and Fitness Center. We are a gym that falls under the umbrella of Tallahassee Memorial Healthcare. I'm a certified personal trainer, certified group fitness instructor, and I am also a new mother. So I'm very excited to be joined by Dr. Adana, Adana Amanze, who is a maternal fetal medicine specialist at Tallahassee Perinatal Consultants. She's also part of our medical staff here at TMH. Dr. Amanze is board certified in obstetrics and gynecology and maternal fetal medicine. She works with both high and low risk mothers and strives to help them make the best educated health decisions for themselves and their families. We're also joined today by Jen Graham. She's a registered dietitian nutritionist at TMH. Jen works in our children's center and postpartum family care unit. She helps mothers, newborns, children, and their families practice healthy eating habits and consume the nutrients to stay healthy and manage ongoing health conditions. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Armande and Jen. You're welcome. Happy to be here. Together, Dr. Armande, Jen, and I will be answering your questions about having a healthy pregnancy. Many of you submitted these questions ahead of time, so we'll be diving into them momentarily. If you have any additional questions as we go on, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to submit them. I'll be monitoring them as they come through and sharing them with our experts in real time. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, Dr. Amanze, this first question is for you. It feels like the natural place to start is at the very beginning, right? Let's say I'm planning to get pregnant. What should I start doing to set myself up for a healthy pregnancy? All right, can you hear me okay? Awesome. Hi everyone, again, Dr. Amanzi. Um, I think in the beginning, it's important to individualize. Um, to get to a healthy start, what I encourage patients, particularly if you have any health conditions or pre-existing conditions, whether it's diabetes or high blood pressure, or if you had a prior preterm baby, um, or maybe um, you're over the age of 35, um, or you're on certain medications for different illnesses, it's always a good idea if you are able to speak to a specialist. Um, I see a lot of patients prior to pregnancy, so we can kind of get a game plan that's individualized as far as treatment, stuff that we need to optimize, maybe medications that we don't need to be on, um, how we need to get better optimization as far as our disease process or our medical illnesses. So we kind of form an individualized treatment plan. So if possible, it's always a good idea to start have that conversation prior to getting pregnant. That's great advice. So Jen, the next question is gonna be for you. Do you have any additional recommendations from a nutritional perspective? I do. Um, and this is something, if you're not currently um, already doing this, I would just ensure that you're getting um, all the food groups in your diet. Um, so that would be grains, fruits, vegetables, protein sources, making sure you're well hydrated. So getting at least eight cups of fluid in a day. Um, those are, that's a really great starting point mm -hmm. um, to make sure you're getting all those nutrients that your body needs in order to um, be able to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. And I would add to that in addition, if you're able to exercise, depending you know, on whatever pre-existing medical illnesses, um, I always have a, a very transparent conversation with patients in regard to smoking, whether it's marijuana or whether it's cigarettes, tobacco. Um, tobacco increases your risk for certain pregnancy complications, including miscarriage including early labor, including delivery, um, and some other obstetrical complications. And it's the number one reason for a sudden infant death syndrome or what we know as SIDS. Um, as far as marijuana, a lot of us use it for various reasons, whether medical or recreational. 
Um, and the reality is we don't have that much information on the effects of the baby. And there is some concerns that it may affect our little ones as far as their neurological development. That's great advice. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'll also say I was mispronouncing your name, Dr. Monzi, so I apologize for that. Um, okay. <laughs> the question is going to follow up with you, though. How soon after becoming pregnant should one seek medical advice or seek their physician for some prenatal care? Oh, this is for me. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> looking at Jay. <laughs> um, so I think um, as soon as you know, um, it's always important to confirm the pregnancy because what person foremost, we want to make sure that the pregnancy is in the right location. Um, and like I said, it gives them gives you an opportunity to get a jump start on an individualized treatment plan. Um, some of our moms who've had prior high-risk pregnancies, there's some surveillance that we may want to start early on in pregnancy. So I would say as soon as you know that you have a positive pregnancy test, it's always a good um, opportunity to call your OB um, and go from there. And you know, a lot of patients that even know that they're high-risk pregnancies, um, some are very proactive and they also call me along with your OB to get an appointment because you don't necessarily need a referral to see me. Good to know. Is there anything that one should expect when they make that first appointment? As far as with me or with the OB? Yes. Yeah, every OB office is a little bit different, um, but generally with that first appointment, you may not necessarily meet with a physician. Sometimes you'll meet with um, either a nurse or a nurse practitioner or a midwife, and they're generally just getting to know you. Um, kind of getting to know your history, your partner's history, kind of some of the outcomes of, of prior pregnancies. Um, they may do an ultrasound at that time to confirm how far along you are and also may do some blood work. Um, for me, generally what I do, same thing, get to know the patient, get to know your history, kind of set up a treatment plan, um, particularly if you're a high-risk pregnancy, and you may or may not need an ultrasound, just depending on how early you are. Okay. So um, working in a fitness facility and being a trainer and a group fitness instructor, one of the common questions that I do hear is, can I exercise while I'm pregnant? What advice would you give to patients in regards to their health and fitness routines? That's for me. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as far as that, like I tell patients, if you've never exercised before, like I don't want you going to run a marathon <laughs> the next day. Um, it is important, but I would always recommend that you get medical clearance for it because there's certain medical um, medical conditions in pregnancy that we may alter the, the exercise. Um, if you're a high-risk pregnancy and you've had a risk, for example, delivering prematurely, some things we're going to want to modify. So yes, exercise is good. Um, if you were exercising prior um, to exercise at least 30 minutes, um, four or five times a week, I think is reasonable. Um, if you've never exercised before, I think I would start with that 10 to 20 minute mark, three days a week, and then work your way up. Um, obviously avoid contact sports, <laughs> um, which I have to tell, um, a lot of my patients, um, hot yoga, I know it's a big thing. That's a no, no, um, for pregnancy, um, because your balance is going to be off, um, especially as you get further along. Um, but um, things like low impact, whether it's walking, um, riding a stationary bike, swimming, um, yoga, for example, um, Pilates, those are, those are all good um, um, options as far as exercise. And I'll also add to that, um, it is imp important for expecting moms to just realize that their bodies are creating a new life. And so- yeah. If you are used to doing high intensity interval training before your pregnancy, you can still train at a higher pace, but be patient with your body. You know, you don't mm -hmm. have to force yourself into exactly. a walk. walking can be really beneficial swimming mm -hmm. um, and just regularly checking in with your OBGYN to make sure you are healthy and um, you don't develop any issues through the pregnancy. Exactly. And I usually tell patients, you know, whatever your maximum heart rate generally is to try to keep it 
less about about that 80% not to go too much higher than that. Um, and it has a lot of benefits. I mean, as your pregnancy progresses and your baby is growing, um, there's a lot of strain on your back. So that different exercises are gonna help with um, decreasing some of those aches and pains that we experience in pregnancy. And it can also decrease certain complications, um, big things such as high blood pressure in pregnancy, preeclampsia, um, that gestational weight gain that we get, that pregnancy weight gain um, tends to be decreased. And with that, decreases your risk for certain complications like diabetes and pregnancy. So a lot of good benefits. I agree. Yeah. Jen, this next question is gonna be for you. One question that's top of the mind for many expecting mothers is what can and can't they eat? Mm -hmm. What should pregnant moms be eating more of and what should they be eating less of? Is sushi off of the menu for nine months? Okay, so that's a lot of questions, but I think I can eat. Um, so a lot of the questions and what I see um, in the patients that I see here, um, a lot of women aren't aware that, that um, it's, it's risky for them to be eating um, unpasteurized dairy products or um, unpasteurized soft cheeses. So that's really important to avoid. If you're not sure if it's pasteurized or not, just avoid it. Um, avoiding fish that's high in mercury. So that'll be your, um, typically your larger fish. So like tile mm -hmm. fish, swordfish, shark, just avoid, um, albacore tuna, avoid, it's okay to have light tuna. Um, and it's okay to have, um, up to about uh, six ounces a week of, um, fish. So that is something that a lot of people are unaware of. Um, soft serve ice cream is actually something that should be avoided as well because of um, the possibility of having a high amount of bacteria in it that mm -hmm. can cause an infection. Um, foods that should be uh, avoided as well are like herbal teas. And I think we're gonna add, talk about that a little bit later, but um, herbal teas are really something that should be avoided as well as green tea. So even if there's a question about it, um, if you can't call your doctor and ask, just avoid it um, until you get a definitive answer by your doctor. Um, something that women should be eating more of always, it's always fruits and vegetables. Uh, I feel like most women, even before they're pregnant, have a hard time getting in enough fruits and vegetables. So uh, while you are pregnant, it typically uh, at least a couple servings of fruits, at least three servings of vegetables, um, in a day and then getting that dairy in because it's really high in calcium and vitamin D that baby is taking all the nutrients that your body has in order to, to grow and develop. So, um, if you're taking your prenatal vitamin, taking, um, at least three servings or three cups of dairy in a day. So that could be milk, yogurt, um, or a dairy alternative. If you're not into, um, having cow's milk products, that's okay something that's fortified with calcium and vitamin D. Leafy greens are really, um, actually have a good amount of calcium in them as well, um, mm -hmm. but they're not absorbed as well as like it, the dairy products. Um, foods that are high in folic acid or folate and iron are really important as well. So that would be your leafy greens once again, um, beans, nut butters, peanut butter, things like that. Um, sushi, um, if it's cooked, it is mm -hmm. not off the table, but if it's actual sushi and not cooked, that is off the table. Mm -hmm. um, another big thing kind of going along with that, just any undercooked meats, even if it's like a, a nice expensive steak, you want to have it cooked um, so that there's no red. So unfortunately, <laughs> you can't have that um, pan seared uh, ahi tuna or, or steak uh, while you're pregnant because that is, it is a risk. Mm -hmm. um, before we go on to another question that is diet related, you mentioned supplements and prenatal vitamins. Is that something mm -hmm. that someone should discuss with their physician before taking or what are your recommendations when it comes to prenatal vitamins? Is that for me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I would recommend going going ahead and starting a prenatal vitamin, even if you're not pregnant yet, but wanting to get pregnant, just to make sure you're getting all those uh, micronutrients. So especially folic acid, that's really important um, to pre prevent neural, neural tube defects. 
Mm -hmm. um, so going ahead and starting to take that prenatal vitamin and you can find um, a good prenatal vitamin over the counter. There's a lot of them out there. So just making sure that, that it's got that at least 400 uh, micrograms of folic acid in it and um, iron as well. So all prenatal vitamins in the United States have iron in them. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree. I think um, the other thing too with the prenatal vitamins, I, I tell them it, you know, it's probably not a bad idea to have some with DHA in them. And also, um, you know, if you've had a prior child with an open neural tube defect, or if you have a seizure disorder, or if you're taking certain medications, um, the folic acid in your regular prenatal vitamin is not going to be enough. You're going to need a little bit extra. So for those patients, in addition to the prenatal vitamin, they may need additional folic acid to help reduce their risk of open neural tube defects because some medications can cause that. Um, and the other thing, Jenna, was great as far as the diet because I'm always like, yeah, no, you can't have that. No, if you can't have that, your steak needs to be medium well, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. But um, caffeine, um, I mm -hmm. think that's an important thing. There's a Starbucks on every corner and we know them well. Um, so we need to be mindful. I usually try to tell people to reduce that when you're looking at caffeine, not more than 200 a day, mm -hmm. um, that's pretty, generous um, because of the fact that it's not fun going through withdrawal um, when I ask you to stop and there's a lot I'm not saying you can't have any but some of our babies are really sensitive to caffeine and what ends up happening is they end up um, developing what we call fetal arrhythmia which means that the heartbeat is a regular rate but the rhythm is off and the most common reason is because of caffeine or smoking um, women who are rubbing a bunch of cocoa butter on their bellies because they don't want to get stress marks. We think of cocoa and caffeine. So I always have that early conversation too. So for my moms that are pretty heavy caffeine, we're in the South, sweet tea and the coffee and everything to, to kind of slowly cut down on their caffeine. That's a great point. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to add that I forgot to mention about the prenatal vitamins. A lot of women have a hard time um, taking the actual the big horse pills. Exactly. Um, you get that a lot. Um, there mm -hmm. are gummies as yeah. an option. However, most of the gummies don't have iron in them. Right. Um, and you have higher iron needs while you're pregnant. So I would make sure that that gummy has iron in it. Mm -hmm. um, most of them don't have it. So That's correct. you're going to have to look really hard. Correct. That's good to know. Um, I have a quick follow-up on the albacore tuna. Can you share a little bit more on why we should avoid albacore? So yeah. albacore is actually, um, it's a bigger, much bigger fish than um, the other type of tuna, the light tuna. Um, so because of that, it, ha it actually has a, more of a buildup of mercury in its system. The bigger the fish, um, the more mercury they're gonna have because they actually eat the smaller fish and then those those smaller fish eat smaller fish than them so it kind of builds up that way if that makes sense mm -hmm. um does that answer her question hopefully yes and, and mercury is neurotoxic to the baby as far as the development of the neurological and nervous system so that's why we emphasize that too mm -hmm. yeah it's good to know one more question when it comes to our dietary restrictions and suggestions. Um, is it okay to ever have one glass of wine? What about alcohol? I would say no. Okay. Um, Dr. Monzi, do you agree with that? I'm going to say no. <laughs> yeah, we get different answers. We all know this. Um, but in my heart of heart as a physician, I, I just have a hard time saying it's okay to consume alcohol. Um, irregardless of what studies may or may not say, um, everybody metabolizes alcohol differently and we know this. And so one glass of wine and the effects on one individual could be totally different for another individual. And we know that, especially for those of us who may be lightweight. So I always say no alcohol in pregnancy. Yeah. Dr. Monzi, let's talk okay. a little bit about gestational diabetes. What okay. is it, what causes it, and how can moms manage it? 
Wow, this is a load of questions. <laughs> so um, gestational diabetes, we really don't know what causes it. Well, what we actually do is we identify risk factors for it. So my mom, my seasoned moms, when I say seasoned moms, I mean over the age of 35, um, women who've had a prior history of diabetes, um, women of African-American and, and Hispanic descent, women who've had a prior big baby, I'm talking like nine, 10 pounders, um, women whose BMI, when I say BMI, it's your, it's a formula that calculates your pre-pregnancy weight based on your height. And if it's elevated, so when I think of elevated, I mean greater than 30, you're also an increased risk for diabetes. So we identify those risk factors, and especially if you have a strong family history of diabetes. So um, when we think of the placenta, the placenta is an after is the afterbirth that provides so much nutrition. Um, it's kind of a bridge or a two-way connection between the mom and the baby as far as providing nutrition. Um, and within that placenta, there are substances that cause moms, for whatever reason, excuse me, <coughs> to be more susceptible to diabetes. Um, and so it's a healthy normal physiological change in pregnancy to keep blood sugars up to a certain level because the baby still needs glucose to, to maintain um, their development. So this pollen is really bad for me. So, <laughs> excuse me. So because of that, some moms just are more sensitive to that on top of that with the risk factors. So with diabetes, it's it, the complications that can come with that if moms have it and their blood sugars are through the roof and not being um, and not eating appropriately, they're at an increased risk for high blood pressure, which can turn into the more severe form called preeclampsia, increased risk for um, having a bigger baby that may require a C-section, um, increased risk for um, a stillbirth or loss. And a lot of times these babies, when mom's blood sugars are high throughout the pregnancy, are in the NICU for quite a while, the neonatal intensive care unit, because their blood sugars actually do the opposite, can go down. And for moms who've had diabetes, there's approximately a 50% chance that sometime in their lifetime, they will actually have diabetes in general. Yeah. Interesting, okay. Um, so Jen, just piggybacking off of that a little bit, do you ever work with mom, work with moms with gestational diabetes? And I do all the time. Yeah. And what was your question? I'm sorry. I didn't hear the last part. What are your recommendations for them? So, um, generally it is a good idea to control the carbohydrates, um, in their diet. Um, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't have carbohydrates at all especially being pregnant, they do need carbohydrates to uh, maintain fe fetal growth. It's recommended to have at least 175 grams in a day. Um, so uh, I do recommend that, that pregnant moms with gestational diabetes kind of split that up and um, as having 30 grams um, of carbs in the morning, um, 45 grams at lunch and 60 grams at dinner. Um, and, and having 15 grams of carb, um, a carb snack at uh, snack time. So that'll be in between meals and then one right before bedtime. Um, and that's about 180 grams right there. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, if they require extra calories, they can always bump that up by a little bit, but not, I wouldn't go too much more. You can actually increase calories by having other types of foods like protein, increasing protein or, um, a little bit adding more fat. Um, but that is generally what I recommend as well as, um, I do talk to them ab about being referred to the metabolic health center, uh, where they do have an actual outpatient, um, gestational diabetes group mm -hmm. that meets regularly. So, um, that is really beneficial. I know that for a fact. Yeah. And, and in a, in addition, I agree, John, that's, um, the same thing that I counsel my patients, um, um, with um, in pregnancy, maternal fetal medicine, we actually ma manage diabetes too in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of women, if they've been, especially if they have pre existing diabetes and they already have an endocrinologist and they continue, but um, there is that option too for maternal fetal medicine uh, to manage the diabetes. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if I do teach them how to carb count, um, mm -hmm. one thing that does make it a little bit easier, um, if they're having a hard time grasping that, is downloading a carb counting app. So my mm -hmm. fitness pal is also a great resource or something like that. Absolutely. Help, help them and, count the carbs. And that's a great point um, because that's here in my office, we actually do the same thing. We do a lot of the education and give out carb counting and all that good stuff. So I think the message is that there's so many different resources here um, mm -hmm. for women who have diabetes and pregnancy um, that um, to continue to create access, whether it's endocrinology, whether it's also working with you or maternal fetal medicine, those are all the same, all different organizations and entities that can actually manage diabetes and pregnancy. Thank you so much for all that information. That's helpful. Um, but let's go ahead and dive into the next question, which will be for Dr. Ramonzi. Are there any medications that are not safe while, to take while you're pregnant? Are there medications that are safe? What are your thoughts? Very loaded question. I, I'm going to say the quick and easy with this um, is that there's not much research done, obviously, on pregnant women on what medications are safe and what's not. Um, as I mentioned before, if you're on medications for certain medical conditions prior to pregnancy, it's a time to have that discussion to let your primary provider or have a conversation with your OB or, or maternal fetal medicine to say, okay, these are the medications I'm on and maybe they can transition you to something that has a better safety profile. The best message, take home message is before you take any medications, ask. That would be my best thing because there's a whole laundry list of them <laughs> that are safe and that, that we do not recommend. I probably should have asked this question first, but we'll okay. back up just a little bit. Jen, um, let's talk a little bit about allergies. Can moms eat certain foods to help prevent their babies from having allergies? I have not seen that as a correlation, um, but I guess if I think about it, just trying to make sense of that. Um, if you're trying to avoid a food, a certain food or say a high allergen food um, for whatever reason, whether you think you're a sensitive or allergic to it or not, um, and if that you're pregnant, that baby is not being exposed to, to that. So when they go to eat it as they, you know, they're born and start eating foods around six months of age, um, you know, they, they could have a bad reaction because they've never been exposed to it. So that would be my educated guess on that. I have not seen any literature on that. Dr. Monzi, have you seen anything? I, I have not seen any literature on great question. Yeah, it's a great question. I don't, I just don't think we have the information on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, we've talked a lot about taking care of yourself physically while pregnant but mental health is just as important. We have an entire webinar tomorrow that's dedicated to perinatal health, mental health, um, but I'd love for us to touch on it a little bit now too. Pregnancy comes with a lot of hormones and changes to the mood. Dr. Monty, how can moms take care of their mental health while pregnant and why is it so important? Yeah, it's first, uh, just kind of like what I tell them, myself when you're not pregnant you have to take some time out for you um, uh, meditation exercise um, practicing mindfulness um, all that stuff I think is very important as far as that for for my mom that have pre-existing depression or anxiety um, it's not always just about taking the medication you want to make sure that you have a good therapist that you are in contact with too um, from that standpoint and just having a good support group. Um, it's critical because um, when you have depression and anxiety, there you are at increased risk for postpartum depression. Um, and it's real, it's real. And in addition to that, postpartum psychosis. So definitely it, it um, is very essential. Sometimes nowadays with everything going on, probably more essential than that, prenatal vitamin <laughs> to really um, make sure that you're taking care of yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. And exercise <laughs> is a great way to also help find some time for yourself and make sure you're yeah. 
stress levels. Um, so now the next question, Dr. Monzi, is everyone's favorite question to ask. <laughs> is it safe to have sex during pregnancy? Are there any extra considerations that mom should keep in mind? Sure. Um, generally, yes, it is safe to have um, sex and pregnancy. Probably, I don't know if that was the answer that many of were looking if you're out there in Facebook world, but yes, it is. <laughs> um, so a lot of it just depends though. You know, there are certain complications in pregnancy, for example, um, with twins or if you've had a prior preterm delivery or bleeding, there may be some exceptions. Um, usually we're pretty good at saying, you know what, this is what's going on. So for right now, I would avoid intercourse, avoid anything um, that may cause an orgasm. Um, with intercourse and with orgasm, they do cause contractions. Um, and so when some women will have contractions that can last for like an hour or two afterwards, I just caution women about that. That's not something that's going to put you into labor, but obviously it could be alarming. Yeah. Okay, that's <laughs> no. Uh, Jen, this question will be for you. We have a participant asking about morning sickness. Mm -hmm. Do you have any recommendations on what to eat if you're having bad morning sickness? Um, typically, the recommendations are individualized, but in general, it is a good idea to avoid those high fat, greasy foods, things like French fries, fried chicken. Um, try to avoid those as much as possible. Trying to eat small frequent meals as opposed to eating three large meals or um, skipping meals. That's, that's going to definitely um, trigger that nausea and vomiting um, for sure. So trying to always keep something with you, keeping a snack with you, um, crackers at your bedside. As soon as you wake up in the morning, um, it, that's when it kind of usually starts coming on. So having some crackers on your nightstand or in your nightstand or like a little granola bar um, to prevent that nausea from happening. Um, and then also fluids. Um, it's important not to get too full when you are eating a meal. So I would recommend um, drinking your fluids like in between your meals as opposed to with your meals. Um, because if you get too full, then that could also trigger the nausea mm -hmm. and vomiting. Yeah. I'd also add to, so avoid spicy foods and mm -hmm. kind of know your triggers strong right. scents, perfumes, and that type of stuff also can, can cause you to go into the nausea and vomiting cycle. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about when things go wrong. I know the first time I took a small tumble when I was pregnant, I was worried about my baby. Whether it's a fall or bleeding, Dr. Monzi, when should mom seek emergency care? Um, whenever you fall, or if you have any bleeding, you should definitely notify your OB. Um, and depending on what's going on, they're probably going to have you go to the hospital just to be evaluated. Um, depending if you're over 20 weeks, um, they will monitor um, to see um, how baby is doing. They may do some blood testing. Um, they want to see if you're contracting. Um, and a lot of it just depends on the um, a fall that you actually hit your abdomen or a fall where you did not hit your abdomen. So depending on that, if there was direct trauma or not um, to the belly, kind of guides us of how we should monitor you. Yeah. And then one of the top questions we did receive leading up to this talk was about the vaccines, specifically COVID-19 vaccines. Dr. Monzi, is it safe? I was going to say that's for Jen, right? <laughs> <laughs> I cannot make that call. <laughs> yeah. So with, I'm going to let you finish, Tanya. I think I interrupted you. Go ahead. <laughs> no. Is it safe and should they receive it? Yeah, that, that is the question of the day, day by day. Um, currently right now, um, all of our societies, Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Um, we are recommending it. Um, there is, unfortunately, a lot of the trials and the research on the COVID vaccine has not um, included pregnant women or women who are lactating, breastfeeding. Um, 
And so we have collectively have been recommending it because we feel that the benefits of the vaccine outweigh the potential and minimal risks to the baby. Um, pregnancy itself doesn't make you more success, susceptible to get COVID, but we do know for those pregnant women who did get COVID, um, they tend not to do as well if they get really sick as those individuals who are not pregnant. Um, and the vaccine, as a reminder, it's, it's not a live vaccine, so you're not actually getting the virus. You're getting um, protein, essentially, um, to help develop that immunity. Thank you for yeah. that. No problem. Um, so if you guys are ready, we're going to take a few minutes and answer some of the questions from our viewers right now. Sure. Yep. One question that came through, um, the viewer states, I struggle with IBS. Speaking of teas, I generally will use the Smooth Move tea with Senna at least once or twice a week. So Jen, this might be in your world. Um, mm -hmm. Should I not use this since it's an herbal tea or? I would generally not recommend it. Um, and you can definitely talk to your doctor about it, but in general, I would not because that does, it does kind of induce like a contraction type, mm -hmm. um, I guess, sensation. So, um, you know, kind of going back to that, things that ca might cause contractions, you know, yeah. I would in general not, not recommend continuing with that. I would say, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of research on the effects of herbs um, on the developing baby. Um, the only herb that I would recommend um, is ginger. That's really the only mm -hmm. one. We, yeah. we use it a lot as far as the treatment of nausea. Um, but the others, quite honestly, we just haven't done a lot of studies on it to know what the effects it can have on the baby. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, Dr. Amanzi, this next question is for you. Why is an ultrasound done at 28 weeks for high-risk pregnancies if all of the other ultrasounds are so so far have been normal? So basically this person okay. before, yeah. Okay, well, a lot of the times we're following the ultrasound to evaluate the growth. So it's not only at 28 weeks, sometimes it could be at 32 weeks. Um, because a lot of times there is an increased risk for the baby being on the smaller side, um, especially for sometimes with some of the seasoned moms after we do the medical exam ultrasound at 20 weeks or what people finally call the anatomy exam. Um, for seasoned moms, it's sometimes some abnormalities or birth defects and the baby don't develop until later on in pregnancy. So sometimes for us as specialists, we like to take another look and to monitor that trend um, from that standpoint. So there are a few conditions in pregnancy for high-risk moms that they are more at increased risk for that a lot of times um, will develop, particularly after 20, 28 weeks. Okay. Do you have any recommendations for someone with PCOS trying to get pregnant other than weight loss? Um, for my patients who have been trying to conceive, um, I think a lot of times it's really good within OB, there's a, a specialist that specifically is trained in endocrinology and helping women to conceive. So they are reproductive infertility specialists. Um, and that is someone that kind of evaluates hormone levels uh, for both you and um, also an evaluation of your partner and kind of after the evaluation will give you some options of why they're thinking, uh, what they're thinking that's causing the infertility and give you treatment options. Um, their specialty is a little bit unique and different in that um, as a general OBGYN, we don't necessarily dive as much into that. We may do the beginning um, steps, but if you're still having challenges conceiving, that's what I would recommend. Another question, is there anything safe to take to help sleep in the first trimester? Is insomnia typically a first trimester symptom? I do not remember having it until later on in my last pregnancy. 
Well, I would say one every pregnancy is a little bit different. Um, it's not typically um, just an automatic, just because you're pregnant in the first trimester. Um, some women may take Tylenol um, to help with sleep. Um, again, for me, I try to try more of non-medication, um, thinking I wouldn't exercise late at night um, because some people that get some wired, um, try not watching TV um, at night and trying to fall asleep. So it's kind of your behavioral things that sometimes we take for granted. Um, again, reflection, meditation. You know, when I think of my kids, I have different um, sounds as far as waves or oceans, trying to develop a routine from that standpoint. Um, Benadryl is a good option too, to help you go to sleep. Tylenol PM is also a good option. Yeah. And then one more question. Um, is it important to drink more water when you're pregnant versus mm -hmm. when you are not pregnant? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, your body needs minimum 10 eight ounce cups in a day. So that's about 80 ounces. Um, and that's just to maintain your hydration um, and keeping your, your fluid level, like amniotic fluid up and everything. So it is really important to maintain that. Yeah. Not going to yeah. be able to maintain that with eight cups in a day. <laughs> yeah. And you got to remember too, when you're pregnant, your blood volume is increasing dramatically because of the baby. And so you're going to need that extra hydration, that extra water to keep your blood volume up, one, and to make sure that your baby's blood volume is increasing appropriately too. So definitely. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we have no more questions. Is there anything else you would like to add? Well, it's just been a pleasure talking to you guys. Yeah. So it was thanks great. for having me. I've learned a lot just listening too. Um, that's always a great, and it's always good to know the names with the faces. Um, since we've been in this COVID world, we don't get out and see each other that much. And so now great. I know if I have additional questions, I can send someone to Jen. And so it's been great information. I, I appreciate <laughs> you guys. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our time today. Thank you so much for your time and for your insight, Dr. Monzi and Jen. And thank you to everyone who tuned in for this discussion. We hope that you will join us for the remainder of our Baby and Family Fair virtual speaker series. Our next panel is tomorrow, Thursday, April 29th at 4.30 p.m. And we will be covering the very important topic of perinatal depression. To see our full lineup and to register, visit tmh.org backslash fair. We hope you have a great evening. Stay safe. Good night. Thank you again. Bye. Bye.